So let us start it. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a new session of uh, the LACNIC webinar. I'm Sandra Reyes of the training team of LACNIC. Today, I'm welcoming you, and uh, I thank you for participating in uh, this uh, uh, webinar in preparedness for uh, uh, LACNIC 42, LACNOG 2024, that will take place uh, in uh, Asuncion, Paraguay. This morning, we have Alejandro Acosta, LACNIC coordinator with uh, the NECBR team. Very briefly, they'll be uh, giving their presentation, but before I give them the floor, let me tell you how we are going to operate. Please notice that uh, Portuguese and English will be available as well as Spanish. You'll be able to use uh, your channels of preference. You'll find uh, the uh, translation in uh, the uh, toolbar in the globe. This will take about an hour. And for the end, we're going to leave uh, about 10 minutes where you have time to ask questions. So please think of questions. If you have any doubts, uh, write them down in the Q&A panel. That's also in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. So finally, let me tell you that this webinar is being recorded. And after that, we're going to share the recording with all of you. And it's all going to be posted uh, at uh, the LACNIC uh, um, uh, 2024 um, uh, website. And now, let me give the floor to Alejandro Costa. Go ahead, you have the floor. Hello, Sandra. Good morning, everybody. Well, first of all, thank you for your introduction, Sandra. I'm Alejandro Costa, and uh, as Sandra pointed out, I work uh, in uh, innovation and uh, uh, development uh, at LACNIC. We have um, our guests from NECBR, and you know that they have vast experience in the IPv6 world, but uh, very briefly, I wanted to point out why we're holding this webinar. This is the last, the second time that we are uh, holding a webinar for preparedness um, for the IPv6 uh, uh, webinar in uh, uh, LACNIC, uh, the next LACNIC event, uh, 42, in uh, Asuncion, Paraguay. So for several years, we have organized a course on IPv6 only. The you know that uh, this is a course that has, uh, well, LACNIC has had uh, over 36 events and uh, it's evolved with time. We started with very basic IPv6 uh, workshops and then advanced IPv6. And then the time came when we had IPv6, uh, advanced IPv6 and basic IPv6 during the same event. And now the recent trend has been to move toward an IPv6 only world. So let me say that um, there's a boom of uh, this of IPv6, and this is where we believe uh, the world is going. So at present, IPv6 only, we are, the idea is uh, to find a solution to the depletion of IPv4 so that the ISPs may offer services, the internet services, on uh, an IPv6 only network, and very probably they'll need to have a few IPv4 addresses. So as to the course that we'll uh, have in Paraguay, let me point out that in the IPv6 only world, we uh, have the CDC, not 64, DNS 64, and we have introduced very recently uh, a part that is not necessarily just uh, IPv6 only, but there's no doubt that it's something that we can't ignore. And that is the part of DHCP6 with prefix delegation. It's a part that we think that um, we uh, had uh, a gap there, and uh, this is how we address it, including this topic that is so important in our courses. The workshops are uh, on open source tools in Linux and NAT64 worlds, and we do it with you. Um, and it's a software that was started in Mexico and supported by LACNIC for many years. Now, let's uh, now introduce our guests. We are going to have uh, our speakers today are Eduardo Barasel and Lucas Jorge. Eduardo Barasal is coordinator of uh, 
the information uh, training on autonomous systems uh, of next PR. And there's no doubt that this curriculum is very long, but uh, I'm going to highlight just a few parts that are absolutely wonderful. For instance, he has uh, created a podcast that is called Tama Ocho, and uh, there's no doubt that it's wonderful. And he coordinates the project on IPv6 uh, and IPv6BR and uh, the best current uh, practices and the uh, uh, training part. And he has an outstanding, he does an outstanding job in uh, Brazil and um, he uh, works with infrastructure in Brazil uh, or for the tutorship of networks. And about Lucas Jorge, he has a background in electric engineering and for 10 years he has worked in IT with an approach in networks and computers developing projects uh, for planning networks and um, environments uh, and uh, technical support at present he works as an analyst of the uh, I mean, NECBR in the training part helping spread knowledge of different technologies in uh, the internet world Eduardo and Jorge, um, I won't uh, go any further. Eduardo, you are going to be the first speaker, and I want to thank you for accepting uh, being speakers and uh, for your invaluable support at the event. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, thank you, Sandra. I'm going to speak in Portuguese. So if you wish to understand uh, any of your native language, if it's not uh, Portuguese, as uh, Alejandra, uh, Sandra pointed out, please to click on uh, the globe and choose your language. So I wanted to thank LACNIC for giving me this opportunity. It's been a long-standing partnership. We've had joint tutorials conveying uh, um, education for Latin America. So it's an honor to participate in this webinar and to be able to present the tutorial at the event that will be held in Asuncion, Paraguay. So, as Alejandro already explained, we are going to hold this uh, webinar as an introduction for the tutorial that we will present in Asuncion. There, we'll explain how to do things uh, hands-on. You'll uh, be at a lab using commands and uh, doing everything that Alejandro says, transition techniques, DHCP, prefix delegation in, IP, in version 6, because it's a flaw of many providers, the fact that they are not familiar with that technology. So I won't dwell on this uh, any longer, but let me share my screen. So let's talk a bit. How do we understand the IPv6-only networks? I'm Eduardo Barazal Morales, and together with Lucas Jorge da Silva, my team, we're going to talk about the IPv6-only networks and how we can reach them. So let's see the history. IPv4 was uh, created in 1983, and for a long time, IPv4 was used, and then people saw that uh, there was a limitation of the IPv4 addresses available for all devices globally. We are speaking of public addresses. That is when uh, they created IPv6 that was created in 1994 as a project, and it, its implementation started in 1998. This implementation was almost um, a zero percent uh, from 1988 to 2011 we continued to use ipv4 but uh, ipv6 was almost dropped out it was abandoned uh, very very few people used it very low usage globally until ipv6 was we started promoting it so that people would migrate the protocols to improve the networks so there was an IPv6 a day, the launching of IPv6, and many others to promote the usage of IPv6. So what happened? IPv4 continued to get depleted regionally. So many people ran out of addresses in the regions, and the use of IPv6 is not yet 100%. It's a bit over 45% globally. And just to mention Brazil, 
we oh, we already saw past 50%. I'm also going to mention some countries in Latin America to see how everybody's doing. So we've grown at quite a sluggish rhythm from 2011 to 2024. It's many years, but there's people are still finding it challenging to implement IPv6. We are then in a scenario where we need to revive IPv4 and, uh, and to think very seriously of IPv6. So here I'm going to talk. Uh, and to say how far we want to reach. So we wanted to offer IPv6 when people are still using IPv4. So thinking of the current situation, this is a chart that shows that in 2011, as we said, almost 0%, some years went by and IPv6 uh, became more frequent. So IPv4 got gradually depleted regionally, and here we see an almost exponential increase in the implementation of IPv6. This exponential increase started to acquire a much more lineal tendency. This is what you see here. And following that uh, lineal tendency, the world must uh, get uh, to 50% by the end of 2025 in a stable manner, because, of course, we have peaks. You may have 50% at the beginning of 2025, but when we see that um, more uh, closer to the end of the year, it, it gets more stable. 50%. That percentage is important because it uh, is. Uh, so now IPv6 uh, uh, starts to be the most used. Uh, it, so it's beyond uh, the usage of IPv6. It's, it's a hallmark that we need to reach next year. And why do I say that this is a sluggish pace? It's a linear progression through, throughout many years. It's not been exponential. We'd like to go faster to use IPv6 indistinctively and, of course, to deactivate IPv4. But it's a slow increase. So let's see how Latin America is doing. The world, this is 46.71. This was yesterday. Um, this, uh, this is the percentage of adoption of IPv6. In our region, only two countries exceeded the 50% uh, bar, Uruguay and Brazil. Those two countries, we can say that IPv6 is used more than IPv4. That's already something very important because this is the internet protocol for these two countries. Now, what's happening in the other countries? Mexico and Guatemala are above average, but we see that there are other countries where, that are below the average, Nicaragua, Trinidad and Tobago, Bolivia, Argentina, Guyana, Colombia, Chile, Salvador, and all the countries that we have here. These other countries in red are well below the average. So what do we expect then with this webinar? The intention is to try and help everyone reach this higher level that everyone is more or less at the same level so that we can evolve together and also thinking about I, the world of IPv6 only. Some countries are well above average, but many countries still have homework to do. This is when we think about an IPv6 only future. So what would be the future then? The future with IPv6 only, that would be the best possible scenario, but we can have other situations. This will, of course, depend on the market, and everyone has to work together. We can think, then, as I said, of different scenarios. One would be an IPv6 only scenario. IPv6 will continue to grow until it reaches 100%, and then we will stop using IPv4. Another scenario 
In both the increase of IPv6 up to about 50%, as we saw, and it is likely that many people will continue using IPv4 and they will disable IPv6 and then have IPv4. And then we can think about the future with the two protocols, IPv6 that will become stable at a given level, for example, 65%, and IPv4 will continue to be used quite a lot. For example, around 90%. Now, which of these futures are really positive. Let us think about each of these. If we think about having the two, all the machines with IPv4, in order to survive, this means that the routers will need to do routing of the two protocols, and the vendors will have to operate with the two vendors, the DNS servers, as well. So we have to do two types of network management, these DNS servers. will have to be considered when programming. This should also be considered. So this will imply higher cost. The devices will require more memory. We'll need to pay more to the programmers so that the two protocols occur at the same time. So this will imply higher cost. The devices and device internet providers. Well, this is the future with the two protocols, and this will become very expensive for all of us. So would we be needing more memory to have that context? If we develop only one of the two, the cost will be much lower. So having the two protocols is not really a very good future, because ultimately we'll have to pay the costs for that. Having IPv4 forever, well, we have to understand that we don't have so many IPv4 addresses. So the idea is to extend the life of IPv4 with different techniques, translation techniques, so, for example, double natting or quadruple natting. Now, these devices that do the translation also involve costs. The devices have to be purchased. Then you have this machine to do the translation. You have to keep these addresses, public and private addresses. So we always have to have all the correspondences of the NATs with these tables. These tables have to be stored. Also considering potential crimes. So these routing tables have to be looked at, uh, into when there are attacks. So for that purpose, we would need a machine to store all these tables, all the logs. This should be a machine that can support the information from all the devices that carry out the translation. In addition to that, we have the brokers. The brokers also imply costs, IPv4 to IPv6, other types of networks. This adds yet further cost. And let us remember that those who request lacking for an IPv4 block it is expected that you will be receiving it within 10 years. So there is a long waiting list, but decisions have to be made right away. And the immediate decision for having IPv4 still applies very high costs. So you have to consider how you will be able to maintain your operations, bear in mind all the additional costs you might have. This will be very expensive for everyone. So the idea we have is to really consider IPv6 forever. 
In other words, having IPv6 only network. This IPv6 only possibility was created to replace IPv4. Let us recall that IPv6 came after IPv4. Many problems arose in IPv4, which IPv6 strove to solve. Of course, there is a whole world required to learn about IPv6. This requires studying, capacity building, and looking into the future, the cost will be much lower because we'll have no longer a need for having translation machines from IPv4 to IPv6. We'll no longer have to pay programmers to figure out solutions to this. And we'll have an enormous amount of IPv6 that will allow us end-to-end -end communication in a much better way. We therefore have to consider whether we are willing to change the way of operating with the networks. Many people are still struggling with IPv4, and people find it difficult to implement IPv6. But we really have to think about all the potential scenarios and think about the future in order to be aware of what we wish to have for our businesses and also to make I, uh, the internet available to everyone. So having discussed this, we think that IPv6 only will be the best solution. After having explained the different scenarios, so let us focus on IPv6 only networks. So that aim, we have to understand how we can have a future IPv6 only network without IPv4. We need three steps. The first one is to start working in dual stack, where we start working with native IPv6. And if we have a native IPv4, we also share it, whether it's shared or native. We cannot disable it today because we are halfway through the implementation of IPv6. We'll need IPv4, we cannot just disable IPv4 from the networks because otherwise you won't be able to access any of the much of the content available in the internet. So it is not possible yet. We cannot disable IPv4 yet. We have to extend the life of IPv4. So this is IPv4, shared uh, or native IPv4. So this initial step is very important for many networks in Latin America. You have seen that there are many that are below the average, and we understand that those that are below average haven't yet enabled IPv6 and only work with IPv4. So we have to start to working with IPv6. So we'll explain the basic concepts of IPv6. And also how the prefixes are delivered, and how the process will then operate to provide connectivity. Many countries of Latin America have many companies that are still at the initial stage of having native IPv6. Now, when we go from the first step to the second step, we can start considering disabling IPv6 gradually. We have those cases where this has been done gradually, so that we can save the IPv4 addresses, but some of the translation machines will start work with IPv6 and leave IPv4 for those machines where that's still needed. So if our machines wish to access something in the internet that is only IPv4, then these are the machines that will be used. 
que são essas aí do NAT64, do 464, do So we will be using NAT64, DNS64, or also use a proxy. A gente passa para o terceiro passo. E aí que está a we we'll then go on to the third step. If we start removing IPv4 from our network family, which will be the auxiliary devices, we can then go on to the third step. This would involve only disabling that machine because all the remaining of the network is in IPv6. So, as I said, we would be keeping some of these limited number of IPv4 addresses, disable IPv4 finally, some of the countries are at the second stage already, but we'll now explain about the third step. We'll be describing issues such as traffic delegation and so on. When we speak then about the first step, we we'll start speaking to speak about native IPv6 and shared IPv4 or native IPv4. Now, the second step that contains all the theory will make available practical exercises that will be shared with you in Asuncion. So if we make progress, let's have a look at the first step, as I was saying. This is just to provide an introduction to the topic. In Asuncion, we'll have a six-hour tutorial to describe this. So, native IPv6, everything that works in IPv4 also has to work in IPv6. We have to update the software. We have old devices that are no longer compatible with IPv6. We have to change these devices and gradually focus on a proper addressing plan. So we are going to work with the two, IPv4, we keep it native if we have a public address as for all, and if not, we share it, and uh, there's one of the techniques that's very common for using them is uh, the uh, 6G NAT. We use uh, the 100.64.00 slash 10, that's uh, what we use. So in uh, understanding this uh, scenario, this is the network of a provider with CGNAT. Here we have uh, the clients. Here's the representation of a house that has a router and CPE. And here you have the devices uh, in the house. So the ISP is going to give the address to these, this home address. They will have an IPv6 address. And if they want to use IPv6 uh, to uh, navigate, they'll go through all uh, the uh, IPv6 network, and it will reach uh, IPv6 uh, in, in the cloud. Now, we no longer have IPv4 addresses for homes. So when even if there's not, if, if there's a CG NAT in uh, uh, the home, we have to give a private address to the router in the home. So here we have a NAT in the customer's house with a private IPv4 address for another IPv4, private IPv4 address, but they need to be different. And that is why it created a space only for the providers for a large uh, um, NATs. And so here we use uh, this, this uh, uh, 164, and then we put a NAT 444 uh, that is going to be able to uh, translate to IPv4. So here we're going to go from private IPv4 to private IPv4 until we reach the border of the network, and it goes from public to uh, from private to public networks. And there, if you wish to talk in the internet, you can translate at the customer's home, and then 
at the provider's level. That is why we say that there's a dual translation. So here, we have to start see, with the, the uh, survival of IPv4 and working with the native IPv6 for all. Notice that in this operation, there are no problems working with the two protocols, and even when the uh, uh, machines uh, receive IPv4 and IPv6, they know how to handle the situation because they use a technique that is called happy eyeballs that works with IPv4 and IPv6, and it all starts in our name resolution. What will it look for? It look, will look for the site in the DNS system. It will look for a uh, quad A, a register, and A, that is IPv4. Uh, quad, quad A is... Um, uh, IPv6. Uh, so you see if it's, um, you need to see if it, it's, there's four A's, it's IPv6 and one, only one it's IPv4. So there it will decide what is the decision that the machines typically take when uh, they receive it. The machine of destination has the two protocols, IPv4 and IPv6, but they need almost simultaneous connections. Then they give a small preference to reference to IPv6, so it opens the connection with IPv6, and right away it opens it with IPv4. What's the idea of this? That the connection, the fastest connection is the one that will prevail. So it gives an advantage to IPv6, thinking that the future will be I, IPv6 only. But it still looks for IPv4, just in case there are any problems. And the other way around, if the IPv4 problems uh, has any problems, then it will choose IPv6. So, um, it, it uh, has translation and IPv6 uh, does not have any translation machines. So putting IPv4 and IPv6 together has no negative impact. And that's what we want to highlight. And here we wanted to talk a bit of some basic concepts of uh, IPv6. Slack, start with prefix delegation. What you provide the customer at home. So and now I'm going to call my colleague Lucas and he will tell you about it. Lucas, can you... I'm going to try to share from here. Can you see my screen? I think that I'm sharing it, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So how are you all? I'm Lucas. How are you doing? I work here in uh, .br with Eduardo in research, and we uh, give uh, NIC, in NICBR, we, we teach. I wanted to thank uh, the entire LACNIC team. They invited us to participate in this webinar. And let me tell you about the culture of IPv6. We'll all be together in Asuncion talking about IPv6 especially highlighting the ancillary techniques for the network providers so that they can start using IPv6. Let's start from the beginning. So, if you are to start uh, working with IPv6, you need to understand it and understand the differences uh, compared to IPv4. How do they work? IPv6, as Eduardo pointed out, came to replace IPv4 since there are no more IPv4 addresses globally. When IPv4 was, create, well, IPv4 was created, the idea was to bring all the problems, or when IPv6 was created, the problem was to solve all the problems in IPv4. And we see right away that the difference between IPv4 and IPv6, the way you exhibit things, the display is different. You use hexadecimal, uh, characters and the addresses are much, much larger. So you know that IPv6 networks has an endless number of addresses. So it came here to solve the problem of the IPv4 address depletion. So not only did they change the face of IPv4, but the structure of the protocol also changed. And uh, so, uh, uh, well, it's uh, here. You you may think that they're all the same because they are IP, but uh, they are not. In uh, to your left, you have the heading of IPv4, and to your right, you have uh, the uh, 
uh, heading of IPv6. And notice that much of the information of the header um, of IPv4 that is presented in red or in pink were removed. They are no longer in the header, not because they were not important, but because they were re uh, um, uh, made uh, or they uh, no longer had uh, a role. So this is the important thing to know what's the difference between the two headers because this enables us to understand that they are not compatible protocols. IPv4 is one protocol and IPv6 is the another. That is why in an environment where we have dual stack, we need to work with the two of them because they won't talk to each other. So if you have the machines in IPv4, that's one case. And if you have IPv6, it's the other. If you want to update the network with very old uh, machines with no IPv4 support, if you're not, they're not updated, they will not be able to work with IPv6. It's very important to be understood. Sometimes we purchase a machine and uh, we have a new set of machines in the network that are not IPv6 compatible. And maybe through an update, you can make it compatible, but very often they are not because of the very structure, the, the way they were built. So they won't allow you to update. And it's important to take this into account because these are two different protocols, although their names are similar. They are not compatible with each other. So something that IPv6 uh, helped us with was in configuring the addresses. In IPv4, we had, for instance, the configuration mode of IPv4 could be manual or it could be a DHCP through a DHCP server. In IPv6, it uh, the line uh, follows this system, but it has other features, other resources that make your life easier. If you want to configure it manually, you can do it, but you'll have to do it really manually, machine by machine, uh, using some kind of script to configure the IP addresses in uh, the machine. And it's not very scalable, each machine that you add in the network. Imagine a router with different interfaces and routes. You have to do all that manually. So it's cumbersome. It takes time. It's sluggish. And it's not very scalable. So what uh, uh, did IPv6 succeed in doing? Well, you can continue to use the DHCP service. Now we have the sixth uh, version and with and also the V6PD, that is a prefix delegation that we can discuss later on. But IPv6 has a new technique that is called Slack. Slack, stateless address auto configuration. Slack, you manage what this enables you to have the machine self configuring a valid IPv6 address for itself. You need a router with the prefix information that you need to use in the network. So when we speak of the types of configuration, Slack, as I said, is stateless. So it doesn't, uh, you don't uh, uh, keep the, uh, you don't save the state of the machine. But it's, it's very quick because you send the prefix and automatically it generates an address, but you keep no record of that. So in the Slack environment, when you send to an IP, you send a prefix um, that generates that IP, but you don't have a, uh, you don't have it recorded. But in HCP, you have two modes, um, stateful, and that works like IPv4. You take the IP that is available in the network, send it to the device, and then you register the information, what machine has which IP. So that helps us oversee the environment and uh, where are the IP addresses. So now let's look this uh, to this as a Slack, uh, um, this stateless address auto configuration system. It's of course, again, it's stateless. This enables the machine to generate the IP addresses that it will use. And there's no need to have any specific configuration in uh, the client's machine. 
So, in the past, how did uh, we do this? How would you go about uh, So, you would take the MAC address, that is the physical internet uh, address, uh, and uses an algorithm with the MAC address, and it generates an IP address for that machine. That's interesting, because you can always generate a public IP address. Once the MAC address is a public address, of a, but it's, it's a security flaw, because you take uh, an IP address generated with a MAC address, and from there you can do the reverse algorithm, and you can guess the client's MAC address just on the basis of the IP address. So, it's not very interesting in terms of privacy. So, because of the same reason, uh, it was changed, and today they recommend uh, using uh, uh, random algorithms. So, you won't use the MAC address, but random algorithms generating random IP addresses, and with that, you avoid that problem of the lack of privacy. So, with Slack, you generate IP addresses for each prefix reported, informed by the uh, router and the router advertiser uh, using the link local, that is the if e 80 uh, slash 10. All the machines using IPv6 will have that address, FE80, already configured. It's important to point out that Slack uses ICMP version 6. So, it uses Neighbor Discovery, NDP, Neighbor Discovery Protocol, together with the router solicitation and router advertisement and uh, prefix information. And why is it important to know this? Because in the Neighbor Disco Discovery Protocol, the NDP, runs on IPv6. So, we have a firewall in the network and we can't block IPv6 because we'll end up killing Slack. It needs a protocol for it to work. And for that communication, we're going to use uh, FE80, some multicast uh, addresses of IPv6. And, and, and if you end up blocking it, IPv6 won't work properly. So, if this so is blocked, IPv6, IPv6 will not be working very well. In the case of IPv4, there was a culture of blocking multicast the multicast addresses, addresses were blocked to in order to avoid any attacks network in the attacks. network. However, However in already in IPv6, already in IPv6 you need the ICMPv6 this is required for the proper functioning when we Slack, use Slack with the Slack with the neighbor with discovery the neighbor protocol. Discovery so you protocol have NDP. to be careful how so you filter the this is then in the network. Required. Here, we have, an example Here we have an example of, the process. of this process. Here you have an address. You send the IPv6 address, address via is sent Slack. Uh, this is via a client Slack that from a client has, uh, that only has uh, a link local, uh, local address FE80, and FE80, and it is submitted and a through a route solicitation with, their, with an origin the IP, IP of origin and the destination with the destination FE80, um, the multicast address. So when the router receives that, it's going to answer the By the router, the it will answer the following to the prefix client. 2001DB8, uh, I have this and, uh, you can address, use so you can use this algorithm, this address a algorithm to generate an IP in order address. to generate an IP address. The client then there is a required IP address. So you can see that this is quite straightforward. You do not need to configure your net routers specifically for that. My own router already reports this. And once again, here we don't have the stateless option. Sorry. We don't know which client uses what IP address and what was the information that was used? Nothing is stored. They only sent the prefix and the client generates the IP address. But we do need to control our networks much better. We have to know how many devices are in my network, how many other devices are being used, what is being used to access the internet. So here we have the DHCPv6. 
This is the same as what occurs with IPv4. You receive the request from the route client, you verify the client's address, you send an IP. So this client X is using this IPv6 address and has a time for using when it stops using the IP address, the process is closed. And once again, the IP address is available in the network. So it has all the benefits that I, DHCP v4 has, but this is for version 6. You can also work in a different way. For example, I might wish to use DHCP v6, but not to deliver IP addresses. I want to deliver only the additional information in addition to the IP information. So this is sent to the client using Slack, but the router cannot convey this information. For example, information on DNS or NTP beyond the prefix itself. So what can we do? We don't have the address. So clients use this to communicate with the DHCP. This is when you work in a stateless manner. The router submits the IP addresses to the clients, and when the clients need to have additional, require additional information, then the server will provide that service, will do that job. So you can work in a stateless or in a stateful way with CHCP, depending on what you need. If you need to register your IP, the IPs that are being used and which clients are using it, then we can do use it with the stateful option. So this is much in the same way as DHCP v4. And otherwise, we can use the stateless option. When we work with DHCP v6, we need to have DHCP v4 with dual stack, because these are two different protocols. The device that works with v4 will have none of the benefits of the stack as DHCP v6. So you have to execute the HCB4 for the IP4 clients and the HCB6 for the IPv6 uh, clients. So it's quite complicated. You have to have the two for the two different types of clients. They work in parallel. Now, in IPv6, we have Another option to work with DHCP v6, which is PD. Address is not delivered, but the prefix belongs to the client. And the client will use this in the best way possible. Eduardo will now tell you how DHCP v6 prefix delegation works. And when we are in Asuncion, we will be explaining how you do the configuration. We'll now look at the theoretical part of how this works and why this is important. So I give the floor back to Eduardo. Thank you, Lucas. So let me stop sharing. I will share my screen now. All right. So regarding the HTTPv6 PD, what is this protocol? It's DHCPv6, but with prefix delegation. This is not available for DHCPv4, it's only available for DHCPv6. So this is why some people find this difficult, it's quite new. But this is the dynamic allocation of IPv6 prefixes. We saw how the addresses were allocated. We can see that configuration can be done manually. This might be easy when you don't have so many machines, but it can become complicated when we have quite a number of machines. We also saw that 
prefixes can be delivered so that this can be distributed to many machines. This is something that is quite new in IPv6. Now, let me show you the graph with the messages. That is why we didn't share it with you before. So, we have the new option, as I was saying, which is delivering prefixes to DHCP v6. This will be used to distribute the prefixes of the network to routers. In IPv4, we have the JCP delivering the IPv4 address, but now we have configuration of new routers to deliver prefixes from one to the other. So the JCPv6 service can be contained in a router. This router, at a home, it starts requesting a prefix from a server that might be in another router. The DHCP client will speak with the server, with the JCP server, and both functions can be contained in the router. So this DHCP server will check whether it has a prefix that can be delivered to the one who's requesting it. So the client in the router at the home will subdivide this prefix in the different faces. It will be much easier to understand when we see the diagram. Here we have the home prefix. You have these four messages, solicit, advertise, request, and reply. Everything begins with the router that requests from the DHPPV6 router to respond to the solicit message and to deliver this. In this case, it is requesting a prefix delegation. The DHCPV6 will respond advertising this. First, it is a solicit message. This is announced in the network, and this is then reserved. The router then will select one of these and will then as for this prefix that was requested, the server where this was requested from will then assign this resource and will reply to the machine and say, this resource is now yours. So in this case, we have the received prefix, which is a slash 56. So it is obtaining this prefix, which will be then be reused to distribute this internally in the machines in that network. So let us now bring together all the ideas that we had from Lucas, who explained this, and how the providers can work, which is one of the scenarios to provide with the last mile. Then we have, for this, we have the PPOE, Point to Point Protocol over Ethernet. We work a lot with IPv4. Many providers use IPPOE. There are some stages that have been followed to provide connectivity. So, just so that we can understand how PPOE works, and how all the ideas that we saw previously can fit into this puzzle. So everything begins when the link is established, which is using this protocol, Link Control Protocol, LCP. Once this session is finished, authentication begins. This can be done through CHAP or PAP. Challenge authentication protocol or password authentication protocol. The one that is most used is the first one, the challenge authentication protocol, CHAP. So the client is asked whether they can receive an address, 
from me. They will check whether it belongs to the network. And if the address is correct, if that is the case, we go over to the next step, which is the configuration of the network layers. There we run the network control protocols, the NCPs, and we have two options here, IPCP for IPv4 and IPv6 CP. If we already have this session working, then IPv6 will not interfere with IPv4 because you've always been on the same link. In addition to working with the IPCP, we'll be having the IPv6 CP. So the operation of IPv6 will not at all interfere with IPv4. So when we enable IPv6 in the network, it won't pose any problems. You don't have any problems to deliver the addresses. And the machine, as we said, have the happy eyeballs, so we'll be receiving these addresses and we'll know how to proceed. So we don't have to fear about running this in our machines and in our networks because they will work independently. Now, everything begins here with the LCPs, then we have the authentication stage, and check whether this is from my network. And then we have to go on to the negotiation of the network configuration. IPC v6 CP will run, will deliver IPv4, and will then add IPv6 delivery. So, through this tunnel that was already established, we'll be able to run DHCP v6. So, here we exchange the parameters and we can then deliver IPv6. So, in the case of IPv4, we deliver the IPv4 address, and in the case of IPv6, we'll establish the communication parameters in order to deliver the address or the prefix in another protocol. For example, the HCP. So, it's only establishing the basis for IPv6. Now, once this has taken place, we're going to run the neighbor discovery. We can work in two different ways. One is delivering Slack, which is a neighbor discovery protocol, delivering this in the WAN of our router with our PC, and within, we're going to include the PD. This will be done in the LAN. I can deliver DHCP in the LAN, and then I can work with prefix delegation. So, when I set this inwards to the routers and MOAs and all the machines of the plant, we need to have the prefix delegation. So it reaches all the device. So remember that uh, in the past we could only give uh, the IP and the router would do the NAT with the private uh, addresses. But with IPv6, we need a method to send it to the our customers, uh, and there is where the prefix uh, delegation uh, uh, plays its role. So we have several recommendations for everybody to be connected with IPv6. Uh, we In one, uh, we need to think of a slash 64, especially to have an idea, the idea of, uh, if you're planning to use Slack. And in LAN, when it goes toward the cost uh, client's house, uh, this uh, slash 56 is our recommendation. So let's see how it all works. Here, we have the uh, provider with PPPoE to be able to establish the communication with the routing. And so we do the uh, client authentication. We check that uh, it belongs to the network and can transit. And we exchange the IPv6 parameters to do the IPv6 delivery. So PPPoE is running here. And then I'm going to deliver the IP here to the 
one so that it will be this interface. It can be via Slack or via DHCP v6. So here I delivered I and here an IP was uh, given uh, in this interface and we have to take it to the customer's house. The device that is in the customer's house needs IPv6 to transit and to talk in the internet. It can, you cannot just leave the address here because there you don't have a net, uh, an IPv6, so you can't route it. And that is why you have to send it inside and that is done with the prefix delegation. So I give a, a prefix to a router and it can divide that prefix of slash 56 into several slash uh, 64s. It's all automated so that through the Slack, you can distribute it in the customer's house. So I have a slash 64 for Wi-Fi for the wired interface, other six, uh, slash 64 for another uh, wired interface, and so on and so forth. So each will take that slash 64 and will auto configure the address. So notice that we are putting together all the ideas that we had. Yes, the earlier we had a prefix in the router so that it will go to the internal uh, network in the house. And for our one interface, we can work with Slack or with DHCP v6 and delivering the address. So we are showing from the theory one of the ways you can work with PPPoE. There are other ways such as EPoE. And I'm going here, we wanted to show you an example. And then in La Clinique d'Ascension, we are going to show you how to configure prefix delegation in the uh, DHCP uh, uh, server, and then how to configure it. So this is more or less what we wanted to show you. Uh, we are reaching the end. This was an hour. Uh, webinar, a one hour uh, webinar. I wanted to thank you and I'd like to call the people of LACNIC just to know whether there are any questions or comments. So thank you for your participation. I want to thank the participants. It, this is going to be recorded. If you have any questions, then you can see it again in LACNIC's YouTube channel. I recommend you that if you can help us, Please disseminate this video so that the people that are going to attend our tutorial may already be familiar and we can uh, speak among more, more difficult things. So thank you. I give the floor back to LACNIC staff. Thank you, Eduardo and uh, uh, Lucas for your participation. Now I I'm going to see whether you can answer the next question in less than one minute. Jorge Gonzalez in the Q&A, this is the only question that we have and we wouldn't have any more time. The question is, what is the recommendation when the upstream provider does not offer IPv6? Uh, in one minute, uh, well, okay, in one minute, I would say very simply, well, you have to change the upstream and you have to change the provider. That would be the most obvious solution. Another situation would be trying to talk with um, the uh, um, uh, someone to uh, offer you this service because in the end they are offering they are selling you an internet connection and an internet connection today is IPv4 should be able to provide IPv6 and IPv4 because uh, IPv4 is depleted in many regions globally so in the future you uh, you absolutely need IPv6. If you don't have IPv6, you won't be uh, able to access the contents and you won't have access. Lucas, would you like to add anything? Yes, I think it's that. I think that you already gave a good answer. That was exactly one minute. Yes, yes, you, you should change your provider. You, at least you have to talk with the provider. So 60 seconds of rapid knowledge. And if you have any more doubts, you can attend the event. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Once again, I want to thank the two of you. I hope to see you in Paraguay, in Asuncion. The video is going to be uh, 
uh, in uh, uh, YouTube. I loved the part of DHCPV6 uh, in, at LACNIC. We see that that is a weak thing. We want you to give more information of DHCP, DHCPV, and for people to make it operational and to understand how it works. So not just uh, to get it, but also to understand how it works. So I, uh, Sandra, well, a round of applause for the speakers, please. 